Historically, criminology has done a very poor job of thinking about the development of offending for girls and women. In the early days, the thinking about female involvement in criminal behavior was so sexist that it would have been better to have completely ignored the offending by women than to actually develop theories for it. So for example, Cesare Lombroso had, as I mentioned, those really sort of like sexist theories about Sicilian women. We saw, again, I'm not going to repeat them because they're not really useful, but my point is that there was a time where criminologists were thinking about female offending from a very sexist perspective. And then and maybe also a sexist perspective, criminologists just forgot about female offending altogether. And it wasn't until like around the 1960s with the women's liberation movement that feminist criminological research really began to emerge. So it was more like sociological research emerged and sociological theories emerged and then criminology looked at these theories and adapted them to understand involvement in criminal behavior. So some theories look at why women engage in less crime. One of the perspectives, which I still think is kind of sexist, is the chivalry theory. The idea that women are treated more leniently than men in various stages of the justice system. And I actually think this is complete bullshit because Researchers actually found that judges can be paternalistic, which is where they believe in, like, if a young girl, eight, and we'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, seven, eight years old, or let's say a young girl who's 12 years old is engaging in criminal behavior, it's more shocking to a judge than a boy that's 12 years old that's engaging in the same criminal behavior because girls are not supposed to do those things and it's okay for boys to be like this. So the girl might actually be punished more punitively. Or when I mentioned those paternalistic attitudes, it's the idea that the young girl might be living in the downtown east side and might be engaging in severe drug use, might be engaging in sex trade work. And these are all really awful things and we want to be able to support this individual so that she no longer has to do those things. We shouldn't incarcerate them because of it. This is another way of restricting a person's freedom and making them angry at the justice system and angry at social systems more generally. The idea is to find ways outside of the formal justice system, so from a public health response, to provide services for this individual should they wish to use them. Other theoretical perspectives, especially stemming from sociology, have focused on why women do involve themselves in crime they focus on things like patriarchal structures where there's you know, glass ceilings or inopportunities in the workforce that create needs to engage in criminal behavior as a way to help, for example, support family members. The integrated liberation and economic marginalization theory had this same idea that I just mentioned, but felt that as women become more equal in the workforce, so as we see greater equality, we would also see greater levels of equality in crime. So as women are more outside of the home, they'll have more opportunities to engage in criminal behavior. This didn't actually happen. We saw the change in, for example, women's employment rates, but we didn't see the crime rate go up. And I don't know if feminist researchers were thinking this perspective through because it really could have actually hurt the women's liberation movement if you're arguing that women were going to commit more crime if they were going to be more able to have equality in the workforce. Other theoretical perspectives from more of a psychological viewpoint have looked at female-specific pathways into criminal behavior. The risk factors for offending differ for girls compared to boys. So girls might respond differently to certain life experiences. And one of these is the experience of physical and or sexual abuse.